over 10 years, we have brought together every year a group of uh, the most uh, significant uh, playwrights, great voices from their countries, young voices emerging mid-career, and often also uh, very, very established writers, uh, because what we do need uh, here in America, but else, everywhere else in the world also, we need to hear um, what uh, uh, stories are out there, like musicians listen to world music to foster their craft, it's vitally important to them, the same should be for playwriting. And often we do feel in the American scene that it's actually not really uh, 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 represented. If you think that over 50% of the New York City inhabitants are not no longer white, uh, if, we, if you look at what's presented on stage or what you see on the television of us, it's, they, these stories are not there. Penn has been a great champion of voices from around the world. Penn is the writer's organization, poets, uh, editors, and novelists. Uh, it was in the very beginning, and it was always a political organization. And, uh, Mailer, or I have remember, many, many others were, 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 um, were uh, heads of the Penn International, uh, Penn International Writers Organization. They have a Freedom for Right uh, program. They really are the ones who get people out of prison. They um, also um, give out significant literary awards. And this is most probably the most significant literary festival in the United States here, perhaps also in the Americas. Over 80 writers are right now at this moment uh, in uh, New York for this festival. We are part of this. It's a great, great, great honor for this Tito Center that we are considered as partners. And um, it fights right in our mission to bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. If you see the lineup, it is truly unique. And I would say, mostly also in the Americas, it would be hard to find another festival with such a concentration of, of uh, talent, of really great, great uh, writers and storytellers uh, are to be seen in three days. We have nine readings, nine readings. I hope you will all be able um, to come back. Um, we will have three readings today. They will all happen in this space. There will be breaks in between in case you stay longer. The important thing is we always have the playwrights with us if we can. So the Marvis, Marvin Carlson <coughs> a grant which we got for the Siegel Center and Jusen and Jack Wood, and we were able to really bring them here, which we couldn't do for all the years. So first of all, we would like to welcome Patricia Cornelius from Australia. <laughs> And, uh, she came to us for this festival, and as you know, we just joke, it's not just a subway right away, it's a long, uh, uh, long trip. So she came here to be with you all in this room, and also, of course, to support the bigger idea. And it is important to listen to voices from around the world. Paul Oster, Salman Rushdie, uh, Michael Roberts, and others created that festival uh, to the Bush uh, government, where they felt there was a tunnel vision, not enough voices were being heard. 95 to 96% of all books published in North America are in the English language. The four, five percent, the rest of it, 50% are German or French, because they are supported by the government, so we really do not uh, hear enough, and they felt it is vitally important, and it has become now a very important uh, contribution. Again, thank you all for coming, thanks for Penn, it's a great start of the day. We were featured in the Times today, also in our festival, was mentioned next to many, many others. So um, we also would like uh, to thank Katie Pearl for the direction. So thank you so much. And um, Luke uh, Christiansen, who's the producer who worked on this, Michael and Brad, up in the booth. Uh, uh, so we are, who's the assistant curator, Antje Oegel, who helped to put this together with me. And then she was a very, very strong force in creating this uh, festival. And, uh, and Yu Chen and, uh, and everybody uh, who works uh, with us. There is also Bella from Brazil, also our staff comes from Taiwan. And so we try to actually also really live what we think of as important. So I will also would like to read from uh, our friends uh, who asked us to do this at this moment. Now we would like to acknowledge the Lenape uh, people upon whose land we are gathered today. And uh, we can pay respect to the Lenape uh, people and ancestors uh, past, present, and future. So thank you all uh, for coming. If you have a cell phone, please do take it out, and I'll do the same. And make sure, is up, did you all take your uh, double check? <laughs> it's show and tell, yes. It never rings in our room, so uh, thank you all. And um, Katie.
Patricia Cornelius. Prologue, lights up. And he goes, look at you. Fuck, look at you. What the fuck you done? You fucking nothing. You never gonna fucking do something. You fucked up, waste of space. What fucking contribution you made? Fucking nothing, nothing at all. You fucked up, nothing, fucking nothing. You are a big fucking nothing. He goes, the biggest fucking nothing I know. The biggest fucking nothing I think. Who the fuck is this fucked up fuck fucking telling me I'm fucked up? Who's he? And I go, who are you to fucking tell me I'm fucking nothing, you fucking fuck? You're the fucking nothing. You're never going to fucking do nothing, fuck. What contribution you, you, and you're telling me I'm fucking nothing makes you fucking way more, fucking way more, fucking way more, fucking nothing. What? Listen to you. What? Fucking over the top. How many fucks you stuffed in that sentence? So? Too many fucks. You sound fucking nuts with that fucking fucking stuff. Way over. Too bad I like it. I like it. Just don't lay it on so fucking thick. Thick carpet of fucks. Way too thick. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit either, but you're not. What? You're not. What? Fuck you what? <laughs> Using it well. <laughs> <laughs> Using it well? That's it. You're not. Oh, Fuck me, I know how to use it well. Go to hell. You're not making the best of it. I know how to make the best of it. You wear it out. I'll wear it any fucking way I want to wear it. You do. You wear it thin. Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. This time the fucking carpet's thin. She can't stop. I can fucking stop. She's I know chronic. She can. No, I can fucking stop. That's probably the first word she ever oh, said. Oh, fuck off. Cute. No, oh, sort of. I like little kids who swear. She's grown up with it. I guess. She, she, she doesn't know any better. Yeah. For her, it's just like saying, please, yeah. fuck you it is. Cunt comes later. Not that much later. When you're a bit older, cunt comes. What, like three? They're the <laughs> best. They are, mm -hmm. they are. Just like them. Mm -hmm. I like them so much. They're like, like bullets. I'm a shotgun. Mm. Machine gun. AK. Like the sharpest blade. A razor blade. A machete. A switch. Mm, they're the strongest. By far. Fuck and cunt. Can't get no better. But no good if they're overdone. Ah, right. What do you want? Just tone it down, would you? Well, what do you think I am, fucking nun? Uh, don't overdo it. I'm addicted. So am I. I couldn't give them up if I tried. No way. And who wants to try? They're strong. Oh, fucking powerful. Tough words. Fucking tough. Frightening. Mm. For some, for most. You say fuck or cunt and you watch them run. I've seen it with my own two eyes. On the train or the tram or the bus. I seen someone. Talk in the talk, fuck this, fuck that, fuck him, fuck, fuck that cunt, fuck you, you fucking cunt, you fucking cunt, you got it, you with me? And they <laughs> got their heads buried, they got sweat pouring, dripping off their foreheads, and they're squirming, and they're shitting themselves, and they're running through the doors, and they're ringing the bells, and they're yelling, oh, next stop, next stop, please! I know, I know, I've seen that. Mm -hmm. I've done that. I've made them run like that. Yeah, who hasn't? It's fucking funny. You watch them cunts go running! Life in them words. Oh, it's electrifying. It's sort of surprising. Yeah, them words have been around for years. They hurt them. They them words hurt them. Burn them. They sting them. Mm -hmm. Make them bleed. I've had them women go, watch your language, please. I've had them. Plenty of them fucking uh, bitches. I said, what are you going to do? Bring the police? I hate them bitches. I fucking hate them too. Looking down their noses. They're words, bitches. Words. Just words. Fucking words. Without swearing. I can't. You can't. 
I'm not sure she can. Can you? Of course I can. Try it. Say something. <laughs> All right. Without one fuck or cunt. Or any of the fucking swearing. All right. Come on. Okay, okay. Hang on. <laughs> Say something. Hello, my name is Bobby, and I couldn't give a fuck. Oh. <laughs> Someone puts their hand in and pulls you out just before you drown. Like someone said, I can fly, I can fly, I've got you. Like someone shoots a crocodile just before it gets you. Like, like a doctor cuts out the rock before it infects you. Like when you jump, someone's going to catch you. Like someone puts their mouth on yours and blows air into you. Like someone says, keep away from her or I'll kill you. Like when a boulder comes pounding down and Superman comes and up into his arm. Like someone grabs you. Just all right, like all right. Sam, nothing's gonna save us. Too late to save us. Way too fucking late. We're past saving. Way past saving. Maybe someone could have saved us when we were little. <sighs> Doubt it. When we were three. From the moment I came out, nothing could save me. Well, from the moment my mom got knocked up, nothing could save me. Nothing at all? A bedroom with a lock on the door. <laughs> oh God, there are ones who listen to music all the time. I did that. Well, it cut down the shouting. In one of those houses I was in, a girl read books. Did that save her? Yeah, sort of, for a while. Saw her off her fucking face when she was about 12. Mm. Drugs can save you. Drugs can save you. When they're in good supply. I used to think someone was gonna save me. Me too. And carry me off somewhere. Me too. And tell me good things. Like, you're a good girl. Well done. Mm. You did real good. You sat up straight. You didn't pick your face. You ate good, girl. You ate. You laughed in the right place. 
You're pretty when you smile. Well, you enjoyed yourself, didn't you? You thought about someone else for a change. You didn't spit in anyone's face. Like someone who gives a shit, who says, I'm here for you. You know that, don't you? And says, do you understand? Are you listening to me? Look at me. Look at my face. You're, you're, you're worth something. What's her name? What? Gotta give her a name, this woman who could have saved us. What? Caitlin. <laughs> How about that? Caitlin cuddles us. She bounces us on her knee. I can't stand being fucking touched, but I'll let Caitlin have a bit of a squeeze. Caitlin's got enormous tits. And all she wants to do is take us in her arms. Oh, yes, please. Mm, to make us happy. Mm, to smooth away the pain. To love us. To stop Billy from saying fuck. And from Bobby calling her cunt. And from biting her neck and draining her blood. Caitlin might have saved us. I had a Caitlin. For about a year I had her. When I was eight, maybe nine. I know I wasn't with her when I was ten. She had these huge tits. And she grabbed me and tuck me into them. I'd be standing there and she'd grab me. I'd be on the couch watching TV and she'd grab me on my way to bed, to school, she just had to move. And she'd grab me and squeeze the fucking shit out of me. Just squeeze me every chance she gets. Squeeze the life out of me, squeeze me to death. Used to have to hold my breath. Then when I was 10, someone else had me. Hmm. Couldn't she save you? No, too far gone. What's she doing squeezing you all the time? Loved me, I guess. Mm. Fuck me. I never had one of them Caitlin's. <laughs> Neither did I. I love her. I love Caitlin. I had them cold fucking fish bitches. Oh, the sit up straight. Don't touch that. That's enough, you greedy guts con. The stop that. Stop that and don't do that kind. When I had treated her dogs better than me. I had one I liked. She was nice. They growl at me when I wouldn't get up and have a wee. Then I got sent back to my mom. That happened to me sometimes. Most of the time I'd piss my bed. I never had one of them big, titty, cuddly ones. Whenever I could, I'd kick the shit out of these dogs. Oh, <laughs> fuck, Bobby. It's not the dog's fucking fault. Mm. Men. I had them. Plenty of them. Too many. Sit on my knee and give me a kiss, kind. The tongue slipping between your lips, kind. This is just between you and me, kind. This is our secret, kind. The stink of their breath. Fuck! I can feel their whiskers. And their fat fingers. And their hard fucking dicks. Yeah, well, boo hoo. Never mind. She says, there's nothing can be done. She's too far gone. Forsaken, she said. Forsaken, I think, what, what's this forsaken? Forsaken, like, like something taken from the Bible, something like totally fucked. And then I know who she's talking about. You know, who is this forsaken? Who's too far gone, who's past saving? And I start laughing. It's this, it's this Danny chick who's fat and ugly, fat, ugly bitch, and I think she, she's it. She's totally for fucking sake, no doubt about it. Spot on. She's the one. Danny ain't got a chance in hell. And then this bitch keeps talking. And it's about me. <laughs> She's talking about me. I'm the one who's fucked. I'm forsaken. <laughs> It's me, it's me, I'm forsaken, me, me, fuck me, me, fuck off, me, for fucking sake, me! A room. <clears throat> Sandra. Fuck, man, fuck. Her face. Smash. Her nose be broke. For sure. Her eye socket, too. I reckon. Other bones. Ribs. Yeah. 
collarbone. Ooh, likely. And stuff inside where he put the boot in. Spleen, maybe. <laughs> kidney? She'll have a bald spot where he pulled her hair out. I had that little girl back. I don't know about that. I could see it coming. Craig was just waiting for the opportunity. And she gave it to him. Shut the fuck up, Sandra. Shut up. She never shuts up. So fucking quiet, you stupid bitch. Bite your tongue. How stupid she is. Fucking is. Can she see that Craig's arcing up? Gone dead in the eyes. Gone too quiet. Looking at her like, with that smile. Is she fucking blind? Blah, 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 blah. On and on. You're a fucking bastard, Craig. I saw you looking at that bitch. You're nothing but a fucking shit. Oh, God, you brainless bitch. Dumb as dog shit. Stupid kind. And in Craig goes. No holding back. Brutal. Mmm. Brutal. She'll go back. She won't. You watch her. She won't. I'll give her a month. Some girls bring it on. I punch her the way she goes on. Brutal. I love a good fight. That was not a fight. Shit, no. That not was, a fair one. That was a massacre. All right, all right, all right, all right. I mean a real one. When you see stars and you taste blood, mm. where your teeth have bitten into your lip, I fucking love them. Even when I lose them, it's like, it's like I'm the king of the world. Come on, take me on, come on, try it. Come on, Bobby, have that around. No thanks. <laughs> We'll stop when we draw blood. No. Oh, you, are you scared? Terrified. Oh, I think you are. I think old Bobby's lost her nerve. You're right, I've lost it. Oh, fucking don't be a pussy. Fucking fight me. Call me a pussy, I don't care. Come on. Didn't you hear her? What's it gotta do with you? She's my protector, she'll fight you instead. I've never seen you back down from a fight. I don't wanna fight Billy. I've fought her, I don't need to fight her again. I've never seen you lose. I've lost plenty, too many. It took me a long time to learn when to fight and when to go doormat. You fight someone who will not hesitate to smash you fair square in the face or the throat or the guts. You just fucked yourself. If he's pissed or out of it and you're sure he won't remember the fucking fight, hit him hard in the nuts, bash his head in with a brick, knock him out. But if he's with it, go soft. Drop like a cake all your weight. Go limp and cover your face and hope to fucking God he won't lift you and hit you or while you're down kick you. Yeah, it's a risk playing dead. It is. Cause he could fucking lay into you. You hope he'll forget you're there. That's when some of them fuck you. Yeah, yeah, they do. Let's not go there. It takes ages to get over a beating. It wrecks your face, it breaks bones, it kills a beating, guys. It fucking kills. Like Sandra. Like Sandra. Sandra be crying for a long time. Him up 
He's told me he's my father too. Ugh, more of that shit. Figures if he's not. Where do they get off? He picks up the boy and swings him up on his shoulders and he stands at the water's edge. He points out to the sea. The father does as if he's saying to the boy, this is all yours for as far as you can see. The mother joins them, smiling up at them, her eyes for the boy, the boy, the boy is everything. Now his sisters are dancing around, adoring him, and there's this terrible noise, and it pierces their ears as it disturbs the peace, this terrible noise, and I can't believe it, it comes from me. A scream has come up like spew from deep inside me. They look around, and when they see that the noise is mine, they laugh and are drawn back to the beautiful boy, forgetting me. Later, the boy is alone, playing his game in the shallows. He's giving orders to the waves as if they're his men, and he's leading them to shore. He's lost completely in his imagining, nothing to worry him, to distract him, to disturb him from this world he's in, a world I've never been in. I've never, not once, not even for a second. And suddenly a wave larger than the rest comes and topples him and here's my chance. You got him? Got him. Yes, I got him. I've got him too. <laughs> I've got him. Is he struggling? Not much. Don't let him fool you. When are we gonna let him up? We're not. You gotta let him up sometime. Why? Not gonna kill him, are we? Yep. Why not? Shit! I don't wanna kill him! We'll let him up. I just wanna frighten him a bit. Save him. That's enough! Better hurry up. That's enough! Gone. They wait in ambush. A room. When's the last time you cried? Never cried. When you were a baby, you would have cried. Nope. All babies cry. Do they? For a while, they cry, and then they stop. I don't remember crying. Even when I've been slapped or punched or kicked, been square hit, once I copped it right on the nose, my eyes watered and tears came down, but they weren't real tears, not real ones. You never been in that much pain? I don't feel pain. Bullshit. No, I'm not making it up. I just don't feel much. That's why I don't bother with slashing up. It does nothing for me. I don't get any relief. Bullshit. Come here. Let's see if that's true. I'm happy to hurt you. I've got no time for tears. Okay, I hate crybabies. They shit me with their tears. I don't cry. What boy I lived with cried all the time. All you had to do was look at him and he'd cry. He was the house punching bag. You pass him in the hallway, you hit him. You sit and you eat your dinner and you kick him. He cried and someone would hit him and make him stop. And did he? Of course not. I faked it. Oh, plenty of times I taped it on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
cried when you were a kid? Don't think I did. What about crying because you feel bad or sad about something? No. What about at a sad film? No. What about for yourself, just because you feel sad about life or something else? No. Is that weird? You never feel sad for anyone? No! Fuck them! Do you? Yeah, sometimes. I think I do. I feel sad for my mom. Not so much now, but when I was young, I felt sad for her. I heard you. What? I heard you crying for your mom. Bull fucking shit, Billy. You did uh, not. You were in the room next to mine, and they came in and told you your mom wasn't coming, and you cried your head off. When was this? Uh, when we were in that Rizzi unit one time. That was a long time ago. Where was I? You weren't in that one. Now everything's fine with my mom. I see her all the time. <coughs> when? What? When do you see her? I saw her not that long ago. Ooh, how long? Ease up, will you? I'm just interested, that's all. I don't know, a few weeks. Months ago. Mm, really? You deaf or something? When's the last time you saw your mom? <sighs> you kidding? You never see her. I fucking don't want to see her. I'd rather fucking die than see that fucking cunt. Oh my god, don't call your mom a cunt. Oh, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> I don't go for all this. You gotta love your mom. I don't get it. My mom does not deserve to be loved. She's a cunt. You shouldn't be angry with your mom. I'm not angry with her. I just don't give a shit about her. I never think about her. Bobby's mom's a cunt, too. Don't call my mom a cunt. <laughs> I'm sorry, but she is. Why bring my mom into this? You fucking hell, Billy. <coughs> just leave her mom alone. Oh, fuck off. Her mom's a fucking brain-dead junkie just like mine. Yeah, that might be the case, but I love my mom. You do not. Of course she does. No, she doesn't. Billy, she does. You don't, do you? No, she's a cunt. Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> I used to cry when I got hurt, but not for a long time. You don't cry because you feel sad? Oh, I don't like it, crying. It's a waste of time, so I decided not to. You never feel sad? No, not really. Nor do I. I think it's all a lie, this feeling <clears throat> stuff. I don't reckon most people feel much. I think they feel fuck all. I don't really know anyone who's kind. Do you? There are kind people. Yeah, name one. I don't know their names. Because they don't exist. What about <laughs> that Caitlin? Mm -hmm. Caitlin's weird, not kind. There are kind people, lots of them. Like them who give money to the poor. Exactly. Or Africa, where people are dying from starvation. I'm fucking starving. So am I. Are you gonna fucking feed us? They don't have to. They have to, don't they? Are you gonna fucking feed us? They are not kind. Yeah, we're taught not to be kind. We're fucking starving in here! They're on the hunt, looking for someone, anyone. A room. I want a horse. I want a dog. I want two dogs. So they can keep each other company. I want a house. A big one. And I want a pool. And a barbecue. And I want curtains on my bedroom window. And a bed. Queen size. With sheets and duvet. I want a fridge. And I want it full of food. Open it and stuff falls out. It's so full. Cheese and margarine, and <laughs> ice cream, chocolate ice cream. I want my life to be nice. I want good things in my life. I want- What right you got? What? I'm just saying what right you got to want all this. I can want. Let her want shit. What makes you think you can want and want? I can want, can I? She can want if she wants Who to. are you to want? I'm just me. I'm like you or anybody else. No, you're not. Leave her. I can want if you can want. I don't want. Mm. I don't want nothing. I do. I want 
things. I want things. Uh -huh. And why do you? What's fucking wrong with wanting things? It's pathetic. It's a bit like you're still a kid. Adults want things. Like you're not full grown. It's like you're on your mommy's tits. Fuck off! I don't want like that. It's like you're not whole. Like you got pieces missing. You're needy. Wanting isn't needy. I'm not needy. I just want a few things. What? What? What is it exactly that you want? I want things. Stuff. Uh -huh. Dogs and a fridge and stuff. Oh, you're just wanting. You're wanting. You're wanting what? I just said. You want too much. No, I don't. You're all right, aren't you? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. What's wrong with you? Nothing. What is so bad about your life? Nothing. Just the wanting. Something. Wanting. Yes. Wanting. Uh, wanting. Ralph, that sounds like to me. What about a baby? Is there anything wrong about want me wanting that? <laughs> you want a baby? Yes, I think I do want one. It's natural to want a baby. Oh, you natural. Know? Most women want one. I do not want one. I said most. What for? What do you mean, what for? What do you, what do you think? For the cash you get? No. Then why? To love it. That's why. Oh, fuck me. You want a baby so you can love it? <laughs> what makes you think you're going to love it? Because that's what happens when you have a baby. You love it. <laughs> Did you love it? Fuck off, Billy. <laughs> Did you? Shut the fuck up. What are you talking about? Bobby had one, and she didn't love it. You had a baby? Yes. When? Can't remember. Years ago. How old? Twelve. What happened to it? Don't know. What was it? A baby. A boy or a girl? A boy or a girl. Shit, you never told me you had a baby? It was a long time ago. You never, ever mentioned a baby. I forgot. She had one, and she didn't love it. Didn't you? No. Do you think about it? No. Do you want to see it? No. Do you think you'll ever? No, 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 no. You want a baby. It's lovely. Oh, you're a baby girl. Big fucking baby. Why are you being so mean to me? I'm not being mean to you. Are a bit. No, I'm not. A bit mean. A lot fucking mean. No, I'm trying to help her out. Doesn't sound like that to me. I don't want her to be disappointed. Forget it. Forgive me for thinking I might like to change something. Now we're getting somewhere. Is that it? You want to change something. I wouldn't mind a change. Mm, you, wouldn't, you want your face lifted. You want your tits big. You want soft lips. Fucking hell, forget it. I don't want nothing. I don't want to change nothing. I don't want from now. I got no wants. Yeah, just ask. Me. You know what? But I don't want to talk to you anymore. You fuck with my head. A room. When I was 15, when I felt like shit, like less than shit, and I couldn't stop feeling it, I'd sneak out early in the morning. Real early, like almost dark early and cold, and I'd think, I gotta do something about this. I gotta stop it. Pull myself out of this shit. I'm sinking in it. I'm stinking of it. And I'd go out the window and down the road and onto the freeway and wait for someone to pull over and pick me up, and then he'd drive me, sometimes way out, or sometimes pull into a nearby street and park under a tree and then I'd fuck him and I'd think, I got you. I got you. I really got you and start to feel real. Feel like I could fuck the world and make it do anything I please. Mm. Something wrong with that. No, there's not. There is. What? Something I can't put my finger on. I don't give a fuck what you think. Something doesn't add up, doesn't sit right. I felt great. I felt yeah, great. I did. I do. Sure you do. Sex is great. Yeah, great. I love sex. I love it. Yeah, sure you do. When was the first time you had sex? Are you kidding me? What? You don't ask that. Why do you want to know What's that? What's wrong with you? You don't ask that. Okay. You don't. I said okay. Jesus, are you stupid or something? Yeah. When was the first time you had sex? Oh my god, dumb as fuck. What's shit. the big fucking deal? You don't fucking ask that. Got it? Got it. When did you? Hmm. <laughs> I can't remember. There's your answer, Samantha. We can't remember. A room. I don't like these. I don't like them. I never wanted them. I got 
no use for them. They were ridiculous. Stupid. The fucking stupid things that I don't want to uh, see. And then bits, but all of them, they've got nothing to do with me. I used to be slim, beautiful skin, lean, all muscle, no ugly bits, no shit handles, no crappy round bits. I fucking don't want this. I never wanted this. It wasn't for me. It's a fucking mistake. And I have to live with it. This mistake, this wrong, the wrongness of this, so out of luck. And this? <laughs> fuck, what the fuck is this? This is not mine. This has nothing to do with me. This fucking stink, this is too much. How the hell do I live with this? This bleed, this muck, this stink that's not mine, that's got nothing to do with me. That belongs to that bitch and that bitch, not me. A room. I've got great tits. I've got great tits. They're not bad. Not bad, they're good. Who said it? I've been told lots of times. I've had them yell out of cars. I can't tell you how many times I've had men groping at them. Like, they like them that much. I've had them making gestures at them from across bars. I was too small. No, they're not. Yeah, I'm letting you know they're not that good. Fuck you, they're good. <laughs> they're like pancakes. They <laughs> they're like are not. squashed. They are fucking not. I'm sorry to be the one telling you the truth for once. I like them. <laughs> That's good. I think they're good. That's good. I like them. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Yours are perfect, I suppose. They are. <laughs> I've got a great ass. I got a great ass. Mm, you've got no ass. I heart-shaped ass my ass. Heart-shaped? Forget it. You got no ass. That's you, bony ass. Fuck off. I'm shapely. Yeah, like a table tag, table leg, shapely. Oh, I've got great legs. I've got great. You legs. have not. I've got the hole between my thighs thing with my legs. Yeah, you've got cankles. Cankles? I have not got cankles. You've got no <laughs> sex appeal. Bullshit. I've got sex appeal. I got so much sex appeal, I got it like it's on tap. I've got it, I've got it all right. You can't keep their hands off me. They can't keep their hands off me. <laughs> they can't stop themselves. They love me that much. They want me and want me and want me some more. I've got so much sex appeal. You got the sex appeal of Yvonne. Who the fuck's Yvonne? That fat girl in the house. The one who, you know, stopped talking, looked so glum, and she was so, 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 so fucking sad all the time. Who look like Yvonne. Yeah, you're sexy as Yvonne. That's you. You're Yvonne. Uh, no way. I'm alive. Hey. I'm on fire. So I should throw a blanket on. What a blanket of water. resounded a run. The three women emerged from the dark edges. They run together like hunting dogs. The footsteps suddenly stop. A room. Women shit. Me. Oh, here we go. We know, we know. They don't weigh in. Yeah, yeah. They're not in for the count. Yeah, yeah. They don't get to play. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They don't mark the ball. Yeah, yeah. They don't kick, hit, they strike no goals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're whining. And they're crying and they're bitching and they're talking shit. Yeah, well. Always talking shit. My God, how much shit they can talk. They're full of it. Women are shit. Yeah, well. And they're stupid skirts. 
And they're tiny fucking shorts and they're fucking high heels! And they're fucking fat tits! What can you say about them? Nothing. Yeah, well, that's how it is. They don't do anything. They don't make anything. They don't have anything. They sit around in their asses. Yeah. Always wanting to be looked at, to be seen, talking too loud, talking obscene, talking like, oh, they love it up the ass, sucking cock, oh, drinking cum, their tits being bit. Like they love it with that one and that one. Yeah, cue it up, bring it on, talking shit. Just they are shit. Not God. shit. Oh my God, they're <laughs> orange faces and they're smelly armpits and they're stinking cold. God, stop cackling. Stop screeching. Stop their silly giggling and their tits all jiggling, thinking they're someone. They're nothing. They're shit. That's it. Shit. I'm not shit. I'm not shit. Hey, 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 hey. What's with all the they? Yeah. What do you mean? They don't do this. They don't do that. Yeah. They can't run. They can't fight. They can't save themselves if they try. I used to run. Who run? In events. I won. Lots of times. But you stopped. Mm-hmm. They go on and on and on. That's all they've oh, not God. got. Not got love. Not got respect. Uh, not got kids. Not got money. Got nowhere to live. On and on and on about what's been done to them. <laughs> oh, he did this. He did that. He touched me. He jumped me. He made me suck his cock. Who gives a shit? <laughs> no one's listening. No one gives a fuck. It's not fair. It's not right. Oh my god. Get a life. Face it. You're shit. All right? We're not shit. And who's you? What? Who are you and all them things? Yeah, who are you? You forget? Don't you know? You're them too. How come you forgot? You talk like you're a bloke. What's with that? Quiet at last. Got nothing more to say. <clears throat> do you think you're a man? Not really. You don't. Do you? Oh my god, you do. <gasps> what are these then? What do you call them? I call them tits. You got a dick? Yeah, show us your dick. Give us a look. Oh, what's wrong? Don't be shy. Let me suck your dick. Come on, big boy, get it out. Do you really think you're not one of us? You can't. You honestly think you're not a chick? Oh my god. Oh my you god, do. you do. You think you're a man. You think you're a fucking man. Pull down your pants. She said, pull down your pants. Pull down your fucking pants. Sam pulls Bobby's trousers down to her knees. You're no fucking different from us. You're a cunt. What are you? A Cunt. You want us to prove it to you? A cunt. I'm sorry, what? Cunt? A cunt. I didn't hear you. A cunt! That's right. A room. You shouldn't have looked at him. I didn't. Mm. You did. I didn't. Yeah, you did. I, I no, I didn't. For fuck's sake, you did. We saw you. We saw you, all right? You did. It's a fucking free country. I can look at him if I want. Why did you? Uh, why not? Because you wanted him. No. Because you wanted to give Sandra the shit. Make your girl offer tips. Yeah, fuck her. You did. Well and truly. She gives me the shit. What's she done to you? She thinks she's king shit. Bitch. Who are you calling bitch? We're here because of you. It's true. No, that's not why we're here. You started it. You did. With your looking. No. You got Sandra all bothered. You got her all hot. Under the collar. No, no, no. What's that got to do with what came later? Because she's at Craig. And Adam and Adam. And then he snaps. And he bashes her. And I repeat, what's that got to do with what came later? Craig bashing Sandra. Craig smashing Sandra. Stirred us up. Unsettled us. Gave us a hunger. Oh, a hunger? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, kind of. A fucking hunger? Yeah, that. Exactly that. Looking for something, anything, someone. Anyone. Anyone. And she came along. She came along, whoever the fuck she was. Poor bitch. Poor bitch. Poor bitch. Because of your looking. Shut the fuck up. Mm, you've done that to me. What? You've tried to con on to all the blokes I had. You never had a bloke worth looking at. I'd have a lot more if it wasn't you looking at them trying to take them all. Believe me, I don't look at your blokes. Mick. You looked at Mick, and then he didn't want me anymore. Oh, Mick. Please, don't make me sick. You can't help yourself, you slut. 
What did you call me? A slut. You want to say that again? Slut. <laughs> slut. <laughs> slut. Slut. They're in for the fight. No! You want to go again? No! No! End of play.
good. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for such a wonderful reading. That was really <laughs> exceptional. <laughs> um, so my name is Peter Eckersold. I'm the executive officer of the PhD program in theatre here. Um, but I'm also from Melbourne, Australia, which is the... Are you born in Melbourne? Or, yeah, um, which is where this play comes from, this wonderful play um, that we just saw written by Patricia Cornelius. And um, Patricia's been able to come over on the long haul from... It's about... I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's, it's a very long flight or series of flights to get here. So thank you so much for coming. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to Siegel Centre, to the Graduate Centre and to New York. And to hear this play that is... Um, uh, I, I've read the play and it's uh, done, uh, had a very good season in Australia directed by uh, a close friend of both of ours, Susie D. So it's very interesting to hear this play, I think, in uh, a different vernacular because I think one of the things that uh, Patricia's work is very good at is writing in uh, vernacular language, writing language of very particular groups of people, uh, working class people, outcasts, and in this case, um, really, I think, uh, a very particular group of, of young women who would be, I think, in the sociological vernacular, termed at risk. <laughs> um, uh, I guess risk is, is a big thing in this play. Um, and um, in this uh, really nice reading we, um, that was directed by Katie Pearl, so thank you to you, and we've got Britt, uh, Britt Faulkner, Shelley Ford, and Elise uh, Liberton doing really a superb reading and um, I'll come back to the question of the language in a minute but just to begin Patricia I just wanted to ask you a little bit about um, where this play came from how did it uh, how did you come to write this play and and what was the context for it in in the Australian context initially where did you see this play going mm. um, it, it happened in a, a, a larger context with um, actually two other writers and a, a group of um, uh, directors and all female and it was a response to uh, the question of uh, actually women in theatre and about how a, a lot of plays in, in Australia and elsewhere are, were engaging with a very powerful uh, men in theatre and the men taking the stage in a very visceral and physical way and, uh, in a, and, and very exciting you know, people loved it and, and I loved it but there's this extraordinary sort of absence of women kind of being able to take the stage in a, in a, in a kind of um, real and uh, that in the same sort of physical way. And so we were developing works and the, they became separate and uh, I went with this one further and further and I was absolutely kind of looking for a, a very unsentimental and kind of true picture of the women that I see in the trams and who, whom I actually both fear and love but you know, the, in my tram local tram is quite famous for go, so going down. Do you, I don't know whether a tram is like a, a very local so. form of uh, public transport in Melbourne so and tram lines run into different parts of the city and depending on your tram line there's all sorts of demographic associations about the, the neighbourhood and the class of the neighbourhood you live in and Trams have very different uh, atmospheres, I guess. So, yeah. yeah. Mm. But, uh, so my trams are really great route to picking up some drugs uh, before you get into the city. And you see, uh, it, it's uh, kind of fabulous and tough and uh, great for a playwright. Okay. <laughs> uh, but but also you, the, the underclass in in Australia is growing uh, daily, and that underclass is. Uh, you know, it, it's a, an appalling thing, but it's also uh, a, a, a frightening thing because there are, a lot of people are very angry and a lot of people um, do shocking things. And I, I was all that stuff I wanted to address. It's, it's really interesting because we know that uh, there's been a very strong conversation about the, uh, the scarcity of women directors in Australian theatre recently. I think that conversation's also taking place here to a degree um, and that that um, the Australian vernacular voice was developed through a series of male playwrights in the 1960s and 70s and the Australian theatre is very famous for this iconic generation of, uh, of often working class playwrights or playwrights writing in the working class vernacular but they're all male 
uh, with, with one or two <coughs> exceptions. And it took another generation and, and people like yourself to begin to explore this very similar sensibility from, uh, from the point of view of women playwrights, women directors and women running companies. Um, Patricia's had a long, long involvement in Melbourne theatre going back many decades and is the co-founder of Melbourne Workers Theatre and um, been involved in very, very strong uh, 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 productions that really do capture this kind of, uh, the, the kind of fractures of society, that the moments of anger, but also I guess the moments, you, you have a capacity I think to uh, dwell in these areas with a, in a way that is uh, extremely human. And, and I think that's um, something that's very interesting about the play, uh, this particular play, and also the use of poetry in the play, I think is really striking because, you know, this is the, the play with all the, this swearing, uh, extraordinary opening scene. Um, it's a little bit like that scene in The Wire where they, they only use the word fuck for, I think, 10 minutes. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful scene and it was so wonderfully performed. But there's this um, question of, uh, language and poetry, I think, in your work, that's something that's very interesting. Do you, do, would you have anything to say about that? Have you thought? I, um, uh, I think, like, slice of life plays where, where you get that absolute accuracy in language. And the, the fact is that swearing or the vernacular can be really tedious. As, you know, so you're always like, oh my God, fuck this, fuck that, fuck, and all that you can't. Yeah. Yeah, after a while, the, the ugliness of it, it, it kind of wears you, at, wears you down. And, so I kind of think the poetry, the grungy poetry, kind of steals or enables you, you to the the authenticity of the language and the power of it without without it kind of wearing you down. Though uh, I think a few people wore <laughs> down by it. <laughs> I was like, I think if you come to a play reading or a play that's called shit, you kind of. Can know, can know that you're in for something, that there's a, a sense of you a warning in it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is a long history of a, a vernacular poet, bush poet, kind of, uh, uh, which, which doesn't have a very good reputation in, in I guess, theatre or literary circles. But what that becomes in, in Australian theatre is very interesting, the generation of playwrights who use this language in an incredibly um, uh, uh, fluid kind of and very beautiful way. So congratulations on that. Um, um, Katie, coming to this play, without knowing anything about the context of it or the background, or I think you met Patricia yesterday or the day this before. Morning. Um, so <laughs> this morning. Um, what were your impressions of, of, of um, somebody who has to turn it into a, an accomplished reading in a very short amount of time? Yeah. Um, uh, it was, um, I had no idea what to expect. Somebody called me up and they were like, there's this you know, play called Shit, we'd like you to direct it it's by this Australian writer. Um, and the whole process, starting from when I began reading it through today, has been a continual, evolving discovery of, of the play, both in terms of the, the depth of the content, but also the structures that Patricia has put in. And I think the first thing that jumped out of me on the page was the incredible energy of the writing, and it hooked me right, right away <clears throat> with that first monologue, but then there's this amazing stage direction that describes these women like snapping their fingers and sort of strutting their stuff and having like a secret homage to West Side Story. And mm -hmm. there was something that made me immediately lean into that. You know, like first of all, who are these women? Who are these characters? But also, who is this writer? What is this mind that's putting this world together? So I had no idea what to expect. It's sort of like a treasure chest that kept opening. And also Patricia is one of those writers that I really love as a director who doesn't tell you everything on the page. She just says that um, there's a series of scenes that happen in a room and a series of scenes that happen in another time in another place. And so what was really rich about our rehearsal process was discovering the story of what was happening, first of all, what is this room, which we didn't actually know when we started, where are they? We came to feel like they were in pr prison. Um, but what is the event and how does the event play out and what are the steps of those stories that happen outside of the room and the way Patricia's put those, layered those two times on together. So I think we still came to today with still a ton of questions. Um, 
that would be really exciting if we could go into a real rehearsal process. We could keep discovering, but the play really does um, give those answers to you as you dig into it, which is really fantastic. It, it really struck me that the, the, the language really transferred extremely well into the American context. And, yeah. Um, and I don't know what you thought, Patricia, but I was, uh, I was kind of watching this play with kind of two minds because I could see the kind of Australian connections and the use of language just quite different use of language to, I think, American English. We were curious about that going into it, if we would sort of run into stumbling blocks. And while there are um, Australianisms with some word choices, the, p the pace and the rhythm... The rhythm is really is exceptional. ...completely yeah. translates across continent, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. Uh, just to ask the three actors, uh, Britt, Shelley, and Elise, how, how you felt uh, coming to this play? Were you... Um, because you, you seem to inhabit the roles really, really <laughs> wonderfully. <laughs> um, um, mm. uh, I was struck by, um, I also had a lot of questions coming in about how, how is this, um, how will our experience as Americans inform us working on this play by an Australian playwright and was immediately struck on the first day by the um, really terrible fact that no, in most countries in the world, you'll find young women who have been classified as unacceptable. You will find young women who, um, who are in the situation that these characters are in with um, struggling with a lot of poverty and very few resources uh, to navigate um, all of the things that life is, is throwing at them. Um, and that aspect of it is, um, is very easy to enter, um, even being someone from a different country than the, than the playwright. Um, and that was my first in, because I, I recognized, the, uh, I recognized the, the women in this play, um, the people in this play. I think I was just excited, so excited to use these words as a woman and as an actress. I don't know any other character who gets to talk like this. <laughs> so um, entering in that way and being like, oh, my inner monologue running to the train, my frustration is somewhat <laughs> similar to this sometimes. Um, so that was my in. Yeah. Uh, Katie, kind of w what I loved about working on this piece is that the language was able to hold our experiences so fully. Mm -hmm. And the way we worked on it was phys a very physical way, which I like as an actor. Um, so yeah, uh, it was great. It's just, it's such a gift to get to ex express anger in this way and in such a crafted way mm -hmm. and figure out the humor that also lies in a person's, ex a woman's experience in this world. Just how, how hilarious it is at times when things are so desolate and sad and heavy. Um, so that was a gift, yes. I'll just say one thing that I knew, um, this, uh, I, I've known these women for a long time, sh sh that we share a graduate school background, and I knew I wanted to get in the room with people I already knew because I wanted to be able to be com have the comfort level to be able to say like, you know, like, okay, so grab your tits here, like, and, um, and that was really important. I wanted that to be our zero so that we could be comfortable to really explore. And, w and we're all college-educated women, and these are not college-educated women. So that was one of our first big conversations. It's not that their intelligence level is necessarily lower, although that might be. We might discover that. But their education level is, and how, do we, um, how can that be one transformative key? Yeah, there's, there's also a... Uh, I mean, a, a number of us have worked in, I guess, community theatre outreach programs mm -hmm. with people of various in, with various difficulties in their lives, and um, we've reached a stage where just the, um, the, the people's emotions are very unstable, and, and very often their bodies are actually undeveloped because they've they've experienced hunger, or they've experienced a lack of affection, or they've experienced. Um, very dystopian relationships. Um, the Australian sociologist talks about a politics of 
of this where he says what happens when the mother is a torturer, when somebody grows up in that environment. And he, he uses that as a metaphor to describe a kind of political condition. Not, but uh, it, you know, there are really very distinct um, physicalities associated with people who've experienced lives that, that have had such hardship. And I, I, I just think it's a, it's a rare um, feat for an artist to um, really be able to explore that in a way that is one very human and in another way that's, it, that is able to show us something about that in a way that we can feel compassion and empathy but also feel like we're not just being voyeurs on somebody else's uh, really kind of horrible life. Um, um, so I, I, I found the play really remarkable for that and I think it's something to do with this balance of humour and, um, and, and compassion and anger and rage and fear that you've, that you've, I think, put into the text and that I think you explored in the, in the performance so wonderfully. Um, Frank, have we got time for just a couple of questions from the audience? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yes, would anybody like to make a comment or? Um, we've got a microphone coming. So we are recording this session for posterity, so please use the microphone. Um, I was just curious about you know, we see this from a female perspective because we know these are three girls. But there are so many times in the play, in the, in, in the play where, we, where all the gender is really fluid. So we find that, I think, because women are supposed to be nice or women aren't supposed to be mean or some of the things that, that I think play into that. The gender, I, I thought for a moment, if they were all male, we would only be laughing. Mm. We wouldn't feel all of those, the mother, the, you know, the women under, uh, under oppression, in poverty. If, um, if three males were doing this, I think we would only find humor. Mm. We wouldn't see the cut side. Mm. It, it was something I thought. Did you, I mean, you obviously played around a lot with the sort of, did you, did you think about that from a male perspective, I guess? Um, no, I mean, I sort of... <laughs> I didn't. I didn't give them a thought. But <laughs> it's not. I'm sort of. I feel like I, I was truly wanting to uh, explore a female perspective and the females who who are, are are kind of fighting back and using language and and have no sense of themselves as victims. So there's something powerful in that. But I, I'm not sure I agree with you that I, I I wouldn't feel if there were three young men. I mean, obviously, pregnancy would be, have to be rewritten, but but you know, there's a a sense of the vulnerability of of pe pe people who have experienced nothing but um, well poverty, but also been denied any kind of any presence or any power whatsoever. I think that is sort of a, a genderless kind of, but you know, there are particular things about women's um, plight that's very particular course. Thank you very much to, to everybody. I, I guess it's a question for, for you primarily as writer, which is um, who your influences are in terms of a kind of tradition of women writing in this way. Because I kept thinking of Andrea Dunbar, Rita Sue and Bob Two, The Arbor, you know, her writing about working class life on Bradford Council Estates in England at home, um, writing in quite a kind of coarse language, but also giving working class characters interiority because of course, which is a kind of second sub question about how we try to find balance between representation and caricature. Um, so two questions there really, who are you drawing from in terms of your, your writing influences? Because I kept seeing Dunbar there and how we tread a fine line in terms of representation and caricature. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that I've been influenced you know, by many, many writers, but uh, I, I think I, I wish I could know, know how uh, when I knew about the the evil of sentimentality, and so that as soon as I, I, I was onto that, and there there are plenty of writers that can kind of provided that background for me, is that once you seep into sort of some sacrum kind of 
pity me or this is what happened, or victim or, or, a, or a sense of romanticizing of, a, of, um, of characters that then they're, they're the, the theatre that makes me sick. You know, that really <laughs> is really, well, it's actually an insult and an abhorrence because they, they, they're not real and, and uh, it, it, it's, it's some sort of cover up that we are experiencing. Um, what, what was the second part of the question? The second was about that fine balance. The balance. The fine balance yeah. between representation and caricature. And yeah. I'm particularly asking that in a context of representing working class voices. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm from a working class right. background. And this is a big discussion amongst artist friends at home. Yeah. I mean, I think the experience of, of mostly, of, especially in film, but in working class works is that you get that highly rom romanticised notion like we will fight, we will fight and we will lose. But in the fight is glory and power, but we will lose. And so there, there, there's, a, there's a kind of tradition where you, the, the working class are kind of heightened and the, the fact that the loss is, is, some sort, is just slightly sad, but they'll rise again and uh, you know, actually the, the defeat of the, the union movement in the working class has been pretty dire and, and people do not rise up again after they've been crushed. And um, so I, I, sort of, I feel like the balance is with, with caricature is always a dangerous game, is when you're writing, um, trying to find the, a voice that is, is truly reflective of a class. But I also think that the, the danger is that you, there's a kind of weird mimicry that, that you can uh, be very accurate but, but not very powerful in, in that accuracy. So, yeah, I, the, the balance for me is, is actually, I think, talking about the humour again and, and having be, being able, how far can you go into the kind of misery and you can go quite far if the actual character doesn't kind of see it as such. So you can kind of go, well, fuck me, oh, who gives a shit, I've been fucked, who, you know, who hasn't? You know, there's a kind of flippancy that is kind of delightful, really. But at the, and at the same time, you're know, finding the humour of, I've been fucked. <laughs> you know, you, you, it's sort of, there's a delight there in the balance. And that those things are, are balanced. I mean, how, how, it, how it reflects on in, in Australia, and that, uh, in Australia, drama schools are filled with middle class families very over, overly or well-educated young people who, who, um, who ought to be able to kind of transcend their own class in terms of how to, re to represent. Because I don't necessarily think everybody has to be working class to represent working class. But you kind of go, um, you know, the sound of them and they can't transcend their own, their own class. And so you, we have real problems with um, kind of finding, be able to find a voice in that because otherwise, it's just shocking when uh, you, just, uh, you spend that time you know, uh, wincing. Um, yeah. Time for one more question, and then we'll set up for the next. Yeah. Well, in that case, uh, okay. Yeah. okay. No, it is, oh, sorry. It is interesting. Um, I've never been to Australia, but I work in social service programs, I work in syringe exchange, active drug users, and this just rang so true. It was, the dialogue was so authentic. It was amazing to me, and what is beautiful about it is at the same time, I get really emotional. <laughs> um, you're seeing this really, I don't know if you want to say good side, but sensitive side of them at the same time. Thank you so much. Um, well, um, once again, thank you to the wonderful company of, uh, of uh, readers and directors. And thank you to Patricia for coming on as well. So Patricia will be around for another couple of minutes if you want to talk to her and, and the